happy to speak with attendees whose goals align with mine. I read your website, the sustain.org, and it says throughout the world, people want the same things, access to clean air and water, economic opportunities, a safe and healthy place to raise their kids, shelter, lifelong learning, a sense of community, and the ability to have a say in the decisions that affect their lives. And if we can deliver that, we're essentially changing the world and change the world we must. Um, this year, 2020, um, amazing year for so many reasons. But what we really learned was that the truest threat to our survival as a species is not the simply existence of a deadly virus, but rather the gross societal inequities it exposed and whose harms were exacerbated by the disrespect of science, mixed messaging, and the inability of our leaders to work together. Unfortunately, as I worked my entire career for low-income people, I have to admit I wasn't surprised. And in many respects, the outcome was inevitable. However, the truth is it didn't have to be this way. But I don't wanna spend my 30 minutes, precious as they are, dissecting the pandemic and pointing out all the wrongs. Rather for today, I really wanna just share some of the stories of my patients and other things I've learned um, sharing these lives of people who've lived in our community, really tough lives, but with dignity. And hopefully by sharing this information and their stories, we see a path forward in determining our priorities to build that better community. We are in the midst of a truly existential threat. And if we don't act now, within the next few generations, life as we know it will be unrecognizable. And I don't want that moment to come and I don't want our children and grandchildren to say one day, it didn't have to be this way. And I know, you know, I'm talking about climate change. And just like the coronavirus and some of the police, it's killing black and brown people. Right now, and at rates much higher than everyone else. And we always wanna know why and we always know that context matters. And I hope we're seeing the screen. And as we talk again, as you mentioned in your wanting a better world, we know that health comes just similar to what the World Health Organization says, where it's the conditions under which you live, grow, born and age and the access to monetary and political systems and resources that really define how we survive. And these social determinants of health is really much more responsible for what happens to us, more important than our genes, more important than some of the decisions we make, but all those factors together will help us know who's going to live as long, healthy lives. And I have to talk about my first patient, Anime, because she lived in a community which is one of those that we want to change. She is a 60 something year old woman. I always talk about her in my talks because she opened my eyes to climate change and to my evolution of what happens. I always tell my students in the aha moment where I unlearn things that I've learned. So I'm hoping we have lots of aha moments today. Because she just asked me to simply refill her inhaler. And as I was refilling it, she slips me another form and says, this form is from Florida Power and Light. And they helped me with my light bill. And I'm like, why would a woman who's always adherent suddenly needing this that has never happened before? And it turned out that that year, 2016, was one of our hottest years. And she was unable to really stay cool. Her COPD was exacerbating. And she kept her AC going day and night. And she really couldn't afford to pay the bills. So in order to breathe, she stopped paying her bills so she could and used all her medications and needed help. And in 2016 onward, we are seeing these increasing hot days and nights throughout the United States, throughout the world. And we're seeing patients like Miss Anime. And this is recently, this is 2020 who still can't afford to pay their air conditioning bills during the pandemic. And we're talking about the thin line. I know you guys know this well, but that thin line of our atmosphere that can't be too hot or too cold. 
so we can maintain the planet temperature just right. And we know that it comes from all the pollution and the greenhouse gases that we emit into our environment, into that atmosphere, which then blocks the, the, the absorption and blocking from being reflected out and creates like a down blanket around our world, which is warming our planet. And it's basically too much CO2 making too much heat. We know the sources. We've done this, you've heard it. Um, Sarasota has been working towards making these improvements. We know the transportation, electric, the agriculture. We know the industries that are polluting and we're creating this killer heat. And with Florida, it's even more impactful in that we're going to average more and more days super hot. And what does that mean for people, everyone? I, we think about our tourist industry, but I often think of my patients like Miss Anime. How are they going to survive? And this is Jorge, where the picture before of anime wasn't real. This is Jorge. And he signed and he agreed to be able to be featured the real person and his real house and his real story because he wanted to do what he could for this. Jorge worked on the streets of Miami and he sold those fruits. If you ever come to Miami, there are street vendors selling bags of limes and bags of oranges and they sell flowers. And many of these people are undocumented. They're often invisible in our lives. So Jorge worked day and night. And what he told me was, I have to work. Whether cold or heat, rain or shine, I have to work. Or else he couldn't afford that little shed in the back that he lived in behind the house. And he couldn't send the little money that he had for his family back home. And his house had very, very, that window was all he had. And on very hot days, he would have changes when he did his labs. I knew when Jorge worked every day on those hot streets and came home in those hot nights because his kidney function worsened. And this is what we know about our low income communities that they're exposed to higher particulate matter. Their homes have inadequate conditions, disproportionately higher rates live like Miss Anna May, where her house was old. The AC that she ran day and night would pretty much seep through the cracks in the window, had poor insulation, had mold and mildew, and had an increased energy burden for Miss Anna May and other people in our communities. I think of Jorge and other Latin communities. And when you think of that population of brown people who live between the three states that are experiencing some of the major effects. We have to think about what will happen. Because that takes me to Maria. And many folks during the Zika epidemic didn't recognize what happens when a mom gets infected. And even though her baby didn't get Zika, her postpartum depression worsened and it continued way farther than what we'd expect. And I'm an internist. And so when I saw her, I didn't see her as an OB. I saw her after she had delivered and the baby was reportedly well, but she herself was still depressed. Um, the mental health effects of going through Zika and all the other problems she had um, just compounded each other. And so we know that the climate and the illnesses also affect mentally what happens to our population. And when you look at the vectors that cause these diseases, as the temperature rises, we see the area rising up into the US. So it's no longer just gonna be Florida. We're gonna look at North Carolina and all these other areas as the temperatures rise. And if what else rises? We often talk about sea level rise. And you could see this is maybe 50 years from now, but there's so many things that's impacting us right now. And you see the impact of South Florida where I am and West Coast where you are, um, or where the Sarasota often, the lot of the attendees, even though I'm sure there are attendees all over now that we're on Zoom, but where Sarasota is and the tremendous impact. And with sea level rise, a host of problems that come in. And you'll see, this is from Volo Foundation. I recommend looking at that Volo Foundation report because it outlines all the economic impact, the population impact, the dangers that we face as the sea level rises. And we won't be able to mitigate 
out of this, we do have to make some major changes. But for many of my people that I treat, um, the sea level rise impact is happening to them now. And we anticipate millions more will be displaced. I don't know what's going on right now on the west coast of Florida, but for where my population works in the Little Haiti area, in Alapada, in North Miami, the sea level rise has taken full front because many of the poorer communities, which were developed many years ago near railroad tracks, which are on higher ground, are now the areas that are well sought after by developers. So I had a patient, Marie, who came in because she had moved and was very distraught because she was sleeping on someone's couch. She was in her 70s, her husband had died, and she was living in a very low rent community in Little Haiti. But Little Haiti is over 10 to 12 feet above sea level. And her landlord wanted to sell his building. And when we're in communities where 80% are renters, when the time came and Miss Marie missed her rent because she didn't get all her monies together, he evicted her. She was one of our earliest climate refugees. And so internal migration becomes a huge consideration for this as our climate changes. But it's happening now to my populations in Liberty City, in Little Haiti, that find themselves on high ground. And this comes from my student who points out something very important that we know and that when this tornado went through Beauregard, Alabama, it, worst of all, he says, it went through the very poor communities. And this is from Lake Charles, Louisiana, who Louisiana had five storms this year. And the flooding, it impacts our children, impacts our poor again, and how do we recover? Climate impacts us in four major ways in our health. It, it directly impacts us by extreme heat, by air pollution, by extreme weather. It causes that spread of disease by the vectors, the Zika, the Dengue, the West Nile, the Lyme disease, the spreading of the range when you go into California, all the different tick-borne diseases. We have a disruption of our water and food supply. We have contaminated water. And you saw in the picture of Lake Charles, that flood water is what we call nutrient-rich, filled with bacteria, decaying food that often affects our children, our health, our skin, causes um, as our food production declines, we are seeing increasing hunger and malnutrition worldwide. And what many folks forget is the disruption of our emotional well-being. We use this in the Florida Clinicians for Climate Action. We've done heat wave just to sort of give a quick re reminder of the top things because it's just the tip of the iceberg. There are many more health effects that we know that we'll be discovering. But in heat wave, you won't ever forget H for heat illness, E for exacerbation of heart and lung conditions, A for asthma, T, traumatic injuries. Often with traumatic injuries, people forget during a storm, they go outside and what happened just yesterday in Louisiana, someone was electrocuted. W for water and foodborne illnesses, A for allergies, V for vector-borne diseases, and E for emotional stress. But it is a tip of the iceberg. And as much as I show you these slides with all these words, I want you to pay attention to the age and who's in these pictures. Because we know that children being so low to the ground, and you've probably heard it before, are very much impacted by being closer to the ozone level and worsening all their lung conditions. And we know in asthma, where it's much more present in black and brown people and causing many days lost of school and keeping kids on medications that weren't designed to be on lifelong. And then I think about our youth athletes. And interesting enough, both these youths are from your area on the west coast of Florida. They died in June. And what we know about heat and youth hasn't been enough understood that acclimation is so key. So not surprised that we should be very much on alert when they leave their air conditioned environments and go into that heat in June to start practicing where they've not fully acclimated to incredibly hot days 
and have unnecessary heat stroke and death. We're finding all the environmental factors along with pregnancy and with the clear racial disparities. And then as sea level rise causes so many problems with our water and our nuclear waste and our flooding and our mold and our mental health. And I get to policy because none of this happened without policy. And I bring up 1619 because we talk about our black people and this policy that started in 1619 that created a political system and a societal system that defined people based on their melanin production and subjugated them to poverty based on a policy which started over 400 years ago and which those policies have continued, which have led to heat islands as there's redlining and other policies that has left poor people making much less on the dollar, which then forces them into making decisions that puts them in communities that we are working to change. And as those communities, again, the exacerbation of these inequities were so stark with coronavirus because the same population got accelerated death because of these things that we're seeing right now with climate change, we're seeing it, we coronavirus exposed it. And even with pollution linking it to that long-term effect and worsening death rates on the coronavirus. And our harmful algae broom that we know that comes from a myriad of problems from the heat, from the pollution, from all the factors that we know that came in from policies that we've agreed to, to suppose in many ways make life better for us but in not creating that communities that we strive for. One of the things that we learn and we understand is that the pollution and what we've done to our environment has come at a cost because much of the consumption of the goods and services are done by folks who are wealthier. Yet much of our policies and poverty has forced the folks who are not using the goods and services to be in environments and in communities where they bear the brunt of these inequities. So again, black and brown communities along highways next to coal mines, and that's also just poor white communities often next to coal mines, but are not part of the consumption that's leading to these great pollution and warming of our climate. So I've sort of quickly taken you through um, the people. Remember the pictures of the old people, the children, Jorge, Maria, Marie, who is our climate refugees. But we're all vulnerable, but some are more harm than others. And it's happening now. So how can we use this information? We do and we'll take action, and you've had lots of actions today. However, how do we prioritize it? Any climate solution is a health solution. But as my patients are showing, they are often unable to make those changes themselves because of the poverty. But if we prioritize and have equitable solutions that address their needs and help to solve their problems, we will automatically have solutions that help the rest of our communities. Because only through an equitable solution will we be able to achieve those values that we talked about in the sustainable communities. And I write again, we have to speak up. Physicians, clinicians are trusted messengers. You and your work are trusted and we must speak up and vote. And as advocates, we can continue to learn. We must continue to learn. I always put Project Drawdown because that gives such a uh, summary of so many things we can do. And our goal to educate everyone. Every opportunity you work should be a chance to talk about the climate and talk about the stories, how it affects you and how it affects the story you heard of down the road. And even talk about Jorge who has passed, but he did this as his legacy because he did not have money to work towards educating and doing anything about climate. But he wanted his life story to say that he works rain or shine, cold or heat, he has to work. So in our communities, we have to create a design that takes us from these fences and barriers 
to be able to remove all of them so we can have that community where we can all grow and have what needs met so we can succeed and live a better life. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Holder. Really appreciate your insight and, and examples and experience. We've got some great questions coming into the chat, so please feel free if you haven't yet. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Holder, I know we've got a few minutes for Q&A, so please feel free to ask those. And uh, Darcy has a great question. She also says, Dr. Holder, fantastic presentation and perspective. Thanks for your work. Um, are you aware of any policy or program examples? Um, let me just refresh Are you aware of any policy or program examples that have successfully addressed climate-related displacement and gentrification? Policies that affect it? Um, it's difficult. We live in a community, and this is the issue with capitalism, that as an owner, you have ability to do whatever you need to do with your property. So when you live in it, like the Little Haiti community, 80% are renters. So it's very difficult to tell the renters the owners that they can't do what they can with their properties. So we've created, there's some affordable housing policies and there are policies that have funded affordable housing along some of these lower income properties. And some of the new development have required that they must have affordable housing, even as a gentrification. The funding that's come down for affordable housing has not been consistently used 100% for affordable housing. And so even though we have these policies that are pushing for it, we do have to hold our politicians accountable that all the dollars that's earmarked for affordable housing be used for affordable housing. And any developer, um, even in the little Haiti, the Magic City development had a set aside of about 20, $30 million to be able to address the needs of the community. So there are plans of set-asides, there are plans of um, affordable housing percentage, but often they're not sufficient to make up for the needs because there's already a shortage of housing on my community. But there are some policies that are in place that would work if we could hold people accountable. Great, thank you for that. And we've got a question from Jake that says, how dangerous have the working conditions gotten for undocumented agricultural workers in Florida during this pandemic? Um, it's they're so unprotected because the policies, there's nothing really out there to protect them any longer. And if you look at some of the areas where you see some of the big spikes, like in the Clewiston area, where there are the farms in that area and further south, a lot of it because of the living conditions, they have a higher spike. Now, one thing they tend to be younger than the other population. So even though there is a higher incidence and of the coronavirus in those pockets because of their living conditions, you haven't seen the death rate because they're younger. However, they are, I work with a group that's trying to do testing down in South Dade and in the migrant camps, and there's a reluctance to test, which is a difficult thing because they don't wanna be with the authorities. So a lot of the free testing, there's a reluctance to be part of that. And also if you turn up positive and you're asymptomatic, you can't work. So it's a double-edged sword in that we want to identify early so you don't get sick. However, there's no real way to give them dollars if to stay home. So one of the policies and one of the things that nonprofits are looking at is how to find ways to support a farm worker who has to, to quarantine or isolate because of the illness for the time that they're not working so that testing becomes a priority. So it's, they've been impacted significantly. Thank God they're younger. So the death rates aren't as bad as what you saw in the black communities with older, more comorbidities. Thank you. Thank you for that insight and, and, and the helpful examples. Um, Jennifer has a great question as well that, that builds nicely on this conversation. She asks, what do you think are the steps that we can communicate in our environmental education efforts that individuals can take? Um, I love, I told that in my presentation, I talked about Project Drawdown, that book by Michael Hawkins. It has hundreds of possibilities. 
And the, I like to see where the learner is. And I often say, do some reflection, find your own story, because there's nobody at this point who lives in Florida who have not been impacted by the heat. This summer was incredibly hot. And if you wanted to go walk in the evenings, it was hot. If in the daytime, my AC bill has doubled this year. So there are a lot of instances where you can notice it. Trees, if you're, Latin, if you're wealthy enough to have lots of trees and lawn, your guy has to come every week practically and really cut because the trees are growing faster. Allergy seasons are starting earlier. So if any of these little things are impacting you, you should start paying attention. And then as you bring your story in, then you can say, what can I do? You have a lot of this, um, descriptions all morning of recycling. Individually, I tell folks, cut out meat. If that's one thing you do, let's start simple. Cut out meat at least one, one day a week. Energy efficiency, change out your light bulbs if you can afford it. If not, what are communities doing to get to my community some LED bulbs, things that can decrease their energy burden? How can we make policies that do that? Um, have folks get more educated and how they can vote with the signs. Um, you know, we have to speak the truth and we have to know that time is a essence that we act now. So we can do little things individually. We can educate ourselves. We can continue the right message and we can encourage people to say that we have to stop the mixed messaging. We have to understand the science. We have to trust the science and we have to hold our politicians accountable. We've paid a huge price for that with coronavirus already. And this is an opportunity for us to, as a community, we taught, this is what this is all about. Sustainable communities have got to be sustainable based on their values of understanding and respecting the truth. It's not enough to put up all the pretty buildings if we're going to not be truthful about what we're doing to our community, what we're doing to our planet, what we're doing to each other. So that's, so I see beyond the buildings, beyond the, the way we live and the material side of being sustainable is our true sustainability of our values of truth and honesty and protecting each other. Wonderful points. Thank you for that. And just kind of a fantastic roadmap as we look at, you know, where we go from here too. And I think, you know, your point about, about finding your own story and connection, this is so compelling. Um, even personally, the work I do with young people around the country, it's so often climate change is, is spoken about in the, the context of, you know, far off habitats and environments and animals and not those personal connections, um, even to the individuals that, that we're talking to today. So thank you for that. Um, Bob, Bob has a great uh, comment here. He said, policy will not change until people do. What is equitable, equitable from one point of view isn't from another. Policy follows the will of the people and governments respond to that will. And his question is, do we really have equitable choices when we vote now? Um, you know, folks are really gonna vote their best interest and what they think is their best interest, that is true. So it's how do we have folks understand that doing equitable solution is your best interest. So right now, we are often making decisions that, is, that are not equitable. Just like when affordable housing comes down and we don't use the dollars for affordable housing, how does that impact the rest of us? Again, coronavirus has shown us um, that people that have been invisible for so much of your lives, I'm sure you went grocery shopping and you had mail people deliver and all the folks who would drive by from Amazon and drop packages off, you never even considered them because they were basically invisible. Yet with coronavirus, we saw a whole group of people who became now essential workers and they left invisibility. And we were able to change a little bit what we've done. And for some of us, we gave bigger tips. Other folks, we found ways to wear our mask, try to protect them. So I think it's an awareness of understanding that their problem is our problem. And so if we do improve pollution, whether it's going to cause, you know, I, I fight now with the sugar burning, that they show data that the air quality has improved. Um, at a basic level, they may have done some changes in how they're monitoring. They've done some changes in how they burn at different times, but it's still pollution that's going up in the air and going somewhere. 
So no matter what your data shows, there has to be a push to say, we need to move away from that because somebody's health somewhere in Florida is being impacted by those pollutants. It may not be the folks right where you're monitoring, but somewhere. And also it's warming the climate and it's warming our planet. And as that warming gets higher, I don't care where you live, you're gonna pay a price. And climate change is pushing us to be equitable. It's pushing us to recognize that my neighbor's pollution it's probably going to impact me some time. So I see it, the hopefulness in that, that it's pushing us to be better humans. Um, there's just no other way around it or else we're all going to perish. Great points. And I see that reflected in the comments too. Lots of uh, comments around how important this topic is and really appreciating your insights. I know we've got a couple more minutes for questions. Feel free to add those um, to the chat if we have a few more um, coming in. I see Kevin has a question. Do you have an example of a community that you think is succeeding in these efforts? Um, I don't, the, the problem with our system, I see communities that are succeeding, like many things that Sarasota talks about, they're doing very well. There are parts in our areas, um, Coral Gables have different policies. There are areas in Brickell where the new development, Brickell is a rich part of Miami where there's some new developments that have their apartment buildings, the first few floors no longer have shops and where it's basically built for king tides and the thing to come through. So I see structural changes that they, the Army Corps of Engineers just agreed to put up some seawalls that will protect some communities. Now you're looking at hundreds of years of state of Florida, which was pretty much developed under Jim Crow legislation. So Jim Crow, Crow legislation in most of our cities left black people and poor people in certain areas and richer people in other areas. Then you have the reality of not having education, not having access to capital, not having the resources to be able to grow and succeed at the level. So the communities that are able to mitigate and show improvement tends to be richer. So. Is it better for all of us? Probably not, but there's some policies that has improved situations for some. I showed the picture of the, the student athletes that died in, your, in the West Coast. And from that came some policy change that mandated better training, better breaks for the athletes where they have to now get more water breaks, better awareness of heat stroke and heat illnesses so within communities, you're seeing some steps being made to improve overall. Their policies, their access to, um, like I have in the fire department, they can bring up bulbs. So there's some changes that's happening, but it's not a cohesive policy that will then say that the poor people will do fine. And rather than it's done similar to how we do schools right now, and right now schools are based on property taxes. So the schools that have more property tax are pretty much ahead. Communities that have a lot more resources are doing much better in mitigating against the climate. Um, you can tell who has solar panels. You can tell no matter how much you try, unless there's some real good equitable solutions, that doesn't mean I'm gonna add on to my mortgage and be exploited like what happened with the white green program in some of our communities here, uh, you're going to still have this disparities. But we're slowly getting an understanding. Just having the health message being one 30 minutes, I think has taken, has come a long way where we are looking at the health, we're looking at the heart attacks, we're looking at the heat illnesses, we're looking at the asthma, the skin changes, the allergies, um, the vector born and West Nile, who had West Nile 20 years ago? We got West Nile now because that Aegis aegypti mosquito bites day and night and the mosquito days are now over 300, almost 330. We've added extra days into the mosquito time that they can reproduce. That's extra days to do more harm. Jacksonville put in a screen policy, which definitely helps and they have to do it for renters and for homeowners, and especially for renters, because my the poor population depends a lot on what happens to rental apartment. And that 
definitely save lives and that's not expensive because when you think of opening your windows to get ventilation, if that mosquito is coming in, you don't have screens, you're gonna still be exposed to the vector-borne illnesses like the Zika and the dengue. So Jacksonville was able to put in a policy that mandated that screens be on these windows. And we're hoping that in Florida, down here that we get something as simple as mandating screens. You take it for granted if you have homes that you've bought and you pay for and you have your screens. But if you're a renter, you don't have screens unless we force the landlord to put screens in. So there are lots of things that are happening piecemeal throughout, but the resiliency project that we have in South Florida is looking at the whole project. I know there's a resiliency, the, the compact that's on the West Coast also, and that's going to help us look at this as a community. And 15 years of this program, that's why we want to keep this, this momentum going to bring that message in so that we have the equitable solution and my population I work with to be very much aware. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Dr. Hoder. And I'm curious, we've got, we've got about four minutes left for questions. Feel free to add those to the chat. Um, and, and while we're waiting for more, I would just love to follow up on that and say, you know, kind of on your point of keeping the momentum, if you could, um, you know, have all the people watching today and, and their work with communities and with education groups and, and cities, you name it, um, if you could have everyone take one action to keep that momentum and, and really push us forward in this direction, what, what would um, that be? You know what? At this point, it's voting. And it's so clear, um, if we don't have a leader that believes in the science and will honestly say fossil fuel has to be, we have to transition out if we're going to survive and we don't support that, we're going to take several years back because the reality is we can't mitigate totally out of it. So no matter how many things we think we put in place, unless we have a worldwide leadership where that leadership works together to make those changes worldwide, we will play catch up. And many of us will do okay because we got the money. And we know that the richer you are, the longer you live, the healthier you are. And if that's our values, then we will continue to see that. But I think we're better than that. And as a sustainable community, we are saying that not losing those people who happen to be poor. We're losing so much talent. It's going to cost us more if we don't work together. So I think one thing you can do now is vote. And after this, hold whoever it is accountable to the truth. I don't care if they're Republicans or Democrats, whoever it is, hold them to the truth and push for overall improvement in our climate or else your children and grandchildren will say it didn't have to be this way. Great advice, great point, I think, um, you know, and, and such a good point around, you know, I think we've had so much just energy and focus on the election, but thinking about, you know, how that momentum and that energy gets redirected into these efforts to hold whoever is elected accountable in the future, I think is something that that, that pivot needs to continue to happen and is starting to happen now as well. Um, we've got about two minutes left and I see Darcy's question. Um, she a great point, I'm back to the conversations around the screen policies and renters and, and vulnerabilities there. And she's curious, are there other vulnerabilities that are specific to renters? Um, many, mostly with renters that we see, the biggest issue, I don't know if I put the slide in, but in Dade County, they did the analysis, 1 million homes or 1 million residency with an extreme hurricane are going to be vulnerable because they were built before the highest um, hurricane standards for building construction. So most of those were renters because they're in the poorer communities and that means when that housing stock goes down with an extreme storm, um, those folks have nowhere to go. Where are they going to move? Are they gonna go North Florida, West Florida, out of the state? Are they gonna, I, it's gonna be major, major disruption uh, that is going to impact our renters more and also low income or middle income homeowners who really will not be able to afford their deductible or to repair to the level that's needed after the destruction. So again, will we have abandonment of property and what will that climate migration look like for Florida? And where are these folks gonna go? Hurricane Andrew showed us the displacement. They had Broward and Palm Beach County to move to. 
where is this next group going to go? And you have to look at it on the West Coast too. Where are folks going to move to? Thank you so much, Dr. Holder, for your insight and time. I know there's more questions in the chat. Please feel free to keep that conversation going um, and, and obviously throughout the rest of the afternoon as well. But we so appreciate your time. Thanks to everyone for the wonderful questions and engagement um, and look forward to continuing these important conversations. But thank you so thank much, Dr. You. Holder. Um, and again, keep referring to that stage chat um, for more.